blessing. Life groups are going to be great. They always are. I hope you'll sign up. There are tables in the back after service. Make sure to check it out. It's a good way to connect and build community. But hey, there's no way to kick off a series like Redeeming Sexuality except to put it right out there. Here we go. Are you ready? We're going to jump into it. We are Bill and Marilee Menser. We lead the healing and restoration ministry here at the church. And you hear us speak on Sunday morning every so often. Um, we do that sometimes too. So we're excited to be with you. We're going to go back and forth a little bit today. Hopefully you enjoy. Um, <clears throat> today we are going to look at a topic that created you and me, right? Let's just be straightforward with it. We all came from a sexual union. So we're here because of it. Our world has a lot to say about this topic. Um, whether you're talking television, billboards, magazines, Facebook, whatever media you are taking in, we're sending messages about sexuality, and uh, we want to spend some time today talking about what God's Word says about that. And uh, we've got a couple of art projects as illustrations. Yes, art projects. Can you believe it? It should be fun. Um, and then we'll go back and forth a little bit, just digging into God's Word and uh, seeing what it says about this topic. All right, so let's do it. Yeah, thank you. All right, art project number one. So we're going to do a little analogy here, just to get you going, all right? So let's say we're going to remodel a bathroom, and we're going to DIY this. We've gone to the Home Depot or Lowe's, but we did not go to YouTube to see how people do it when they do it right. So we live in an old farmhouse. This is a wall in our old farmhouse. And this is our crooked floor in our old farmhouse. And you've got your tiles. You put some adhesive down on the wall, and you get ready to set that first tile. And you just kind of get real close to it, right? You're getting in there, and you're like, all right, I'm going to set this one. And so you, you put your first tile on the wall. And it is lined up nice with that floor. And then you keep going, putting your tiles in place. And then you build your way up the wall. And you are so proud. I've done this. I'll admit it. I've done this kind of thing. Not this exact one, but I've done other DIY mistakes. And uh, you get up the wall. And then you kind of step back and look at what you've done. And you're like, oh, my goodness. Why did I not hire a professional or do my homework? When I was right here looking at this, it looked so straight. But when I built my whole wall based on that crooked starting point, I ended up with a mess. <laughs> I wanted friends to come sit on my toilet in the guest bathroom and look at the walls and be amazed. And instead, they're going to be like falling off because the tiles are leaning. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's what this world does if you get in with the world's view of sexuality, you have a crooked starting point. That's really good. We have an enemy of our faith, and he twists what God created. He brings crookedness to this world. There's all kinds of belief systems that are crooked. So we don't want to start there. Instead, I have a level, and I'm kind of using these little pins up here to level the easel to make sure it's nice and straight. And I have a chalk line. Do you want to do it? Marilee's going to help me. We are going to, I've pre-marked here and here, here and here, what is level and plumb on this thing. But the easel's all tricky, so i got to make sure that it's level. <laughs> Good. All right. So let's stretch out this chalk line. And get it tight right there. All right, Marilee, go for it. There we go. This one. Ooh. Wasn't that snap a satisfying snap? a fresh, snap? clean plumb line. We even made a plumb line. <laughs> now, if we can get this guy out of here, we're going to do the same thing this direction. Mm. Right on right there. We're just going to stretch it across right there. Stand by. Our project's in progress. Ready? Bam. So, now we are ready to tile a bathroom. Okay, good, it looks right. We are ready to tile a bathroom, for example, and we could put our first tile right there. Right? I'm just going to draw so that you can imagine that. 
that child over in there. This one, that's perfectly still, you know. Because it's a tile. Somebody made it, and it's really good. Okay. Right? And we're going to build a base row. And it's dumb, and it's level, and it looks beautiful. When you sit on the toilet and look at that once the wall is done, you will not fall over, people. Yes. Yes. So even though, okay, yes, that, that's a good drawing. <laughs> <laughs> so even though we might be in a world with a crooked wall and a crooked floor still, influencing, trying to influence the way we view sexuality, we can come in, and today we're just going to really talk about what is God's truth about it and build off of that and not build off the crookedness. Completely. We want to line up with God's word. God's word is our, so our plumb line. What is God's word? Let's check it out. What do you say? Yeah. All right, let's do it. First art project done, one to go. Thank you. One of the first things we see about sexuality in scriptures, you can find in Genesis 2, 21 to 25. Um, so let's take a look there. It says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the, pl the place with flesh. All right, rib out, flesh closed, good. All right. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. End of Adam's quote there. And then this is what the Bible tells us about this situation. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So two become one flesh. You've probably heard that before if you've been around church for a while. Um, but what we're getting is that God designed sex. That's point number one, actually. I'll just stop there. <laughs> God designed sex. It's not bad. It's actually sacred. It's holy. It comes from God when it's operating in the parameters that he's designed it for. <clears throat> but they become one flesh. So sex is good and bonding. There's an intense bond that happens when people make sexual contact with each other. You're a body, soul, and a spirit. You have a physical body. Soul kind of means you have a will and intellect and emotions. And you have a spirit. You have an eternal spirit God created you with that will live forever. And if you follow Jesus, if you accept his uh, shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins, you can spend eternity with God. And while we're here on this earth, we know that God's Holy Spirit lives inside of us if we follow him, if we've chosen and accepted him. And so our spirit is in connection with him. But when you have sex, body, soul, and spirit make a connection with another human. And it's an intense bonding. Um, <clears throat> that is what God designed for a family. He wants children to be produced out of an intense bond between two people. He wants a family to be raised with that intense bond between two people. And that is a great foundation for a family and then for a, a wider community, all these people with intense bonds coming into community and living together like our church family right here. And that's a great thing. But sex can be taken outside of the context of marriage. And when we do, it doesn't change the fact that sex is bonding. And we see that Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 6 when he says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. So Paul's teaching us, hey, two become one flesh, whether it was Adam and Eve without sin in the garden, or whether it's these Corinthians going to uh, have sex with a prostitute at the temple. We know Cameron taught us last time we did a sex series that the Corinthians lived in a city where sex was worshipped. There was a sex god in a temple, and that was part of the religious actions of the people of that day was to go to the temple and have sex, which is crazy. And he's saying, hey, Corinthians, you're in a church. You're Christians. You're following Jesus. We don't do it that way. There are consequences. That bonding still happens. So don't, don't follow the world, just like we were saying. Line up with God's word instead. So, art project number two. Are you ready? No, they weren't. They weren't ready, Marilyn. Ready? They weren't ready. We're ready. Oh, all right. You're awake. Good. Okay. Good, good. You have a man and a woman. Pink is the woman. Blue is the man. And, this and construction. they these papers are 
hypothetically having sex. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> if they're married papers, that's great. They stay together. But what if they're not and then they come apart? Uh-oh. Maybe he goes off and, you know, goes to college and she goes to another city or something and um, her own way. Uh-oh. Really uh -oh. getting torn up over this breakup. I think she just said, it's not you, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> this is ugly. This is really going to be difficult. She said, hey, let's just be friends. Oh, man, this I is. I don't know if this is can First stay. service was a little cleaner break. This one is rough. <laughs> so two became one flesh, and now it is difficult to take them apart. <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't it? I did a lot more glue on that one than the other one. These people. Here, I'll take the blue and you take Look pink. Look at these poor people. So what happened? He's, he and she are torn to shreds. Look at all the pieces of him that are stuck to her. He's lost some of himself, but she, she still has it. She's lost some of her stuff, and he still has it. It kind of looks like a smiley face, but there's nothing happy about this. <laughs> It's like, we'll turn it upside down. It's a frowny face. <laughs> so the point is that that intense bond, taken out of the context God designed it for, can do a lot of damage. Can do a lot of damage. Yeah, and then the world wants to say that that's just fine and normal, right? The crooked line says just <coughs> having sex with whoever's okay. You can just, you know, um, it's, okay, it's your right to be um, sexually pleased whenever you want. Right? Yeah. yeah, there's all kinds of crooked lies in there, like, oh, yeah. two, two consenting adults, you know, or, hey, we love each other, but that doesn't line up with God's word completely. You know, there's a lot of sexual messages in the world that think sex is just a thing of the body. We forget about the soul and the spirit. It's like, it's just a pleasurable thing we do, like eating ice cream. That's just a lie. That's crooked. That's wrong. That doesn't line you up right, you know, or even... Yeah, or even two two part sex. Like, hey, it's it's a body thing, and and we love each other. This is really meaningful, right? And there have been cultures over the years and religions that worship sex, and they don't do it God's way. It's it's still crooked. It's still wrong. We we miss the two part thing. All right, I so please do. Yeah, I don't know where to start. Yeah. So um, just a couple points I want to make is. Um, how does God want us to respond to the sinful views of our culture regarding sex? Well, um, in Deuteronomy 7, we can read about that. He tells the Israelites, when you go into the land, they're about ready to cross over the Jordan, um, and he says, go into the land I'm giving you. I will drive out the nations before you, but you must finish the job. Totally destroy them. Make no treaty with them. Do not intermarry with them. And so, you know, they were doing sinful things, and God says, this is my way. I want you to live my way and be connected with me. So don't join yourself with their views, their ways of living. Um, totally, you know, separate. Don't accept those as, who, as a part of you. So we want to just be really on purpose in our life to make, you know, we need to remind ourselves of what the truth is often because yeah. we hear these messages of, you know, that the enemy might say, um, you know, entertaining adulterous thoughts is, is fine because you're not acting on it. So it's fine, you know, and like just these lines start to getting smudged. And, and so we need to remind ourselves and come in and snap fresh lines so we're constantly lining up with his way and not the world that's around us constantly bombarding us with a message. <laughs> hey, do you guys want to know what kind of sins and um, sexual immorality was going on with those people? I was, I was curious about this. Um, you know, the Israelites are coming, they're crossing the Jordan, and um, what was so bad? What was so bad about what they were doing that God said, don't do that at all? Well, I can tell you, because in Leviticus 18, it tells us, there's a, it starts out with this big, long list of pretty much don't have sex with a relative, lists like all, you know, don't have sex with your mother, don't have sex with your sister, 
don't have sex with her grandchild, with an aunt, and it just lists all, so you don't have sex with a family member, okay, we get that. Um, but I'm so glad that's in there because, unfortunately, for a lot of kids, they're not taught this, they're not, um, you know, things happen. But anyway, a lot of times, um, children's first sexual experience is with a family member. Um, and so it's so important that we teach our kids so that they know, hey, God's way is like this. The devil's way is like this, you know, and it's not okay for any family member to suggest this or that. You know, we can just teach them in a way that's age appropriate. But they're innocent. They don't know. If someone comes and says, hey, let me see your, or let me show you my, they're just going to think, oh, okay, whatever. This is the same as him bringing in a dog to show you. Okay, let me see the puppy. You know what I mean? So I don't know why I'm saying that. <laughs> um, somebody must need to hear it. It's just important to, to be very clear about what, what God's way is. Um, the list continues. Don't have sex with your neighbor's wife. Um, don't have sex with a man as one does with a woman. Homosexuality. Cameron's actually going to talk about that next week. I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say on that. Don't have sex with an animal. Okay, so all these things were happening, normal things. And so God says, don't pollute yourself, Israelites, in any of these ways. In any of these ways, this is how the nations became polluted, the ones that I'm driving out of the land before you. So I love to know what not to do, right? It's so refreshing to know, okay, this is sin. This is clear. Okay, now I know what to do. Thanks, God. All right, so um, one more. Actually, that's a good one. It's a perfect model of the Corinthians. Should have been reading their Old Testament, right? Like yeah. what was going on all around them was these, you know, worshippers of false goddess and whatever and it's like mm -hmm. that's polluted don't intermarry with that don't intermarry your mind and your belief system with that what's going on around you okay so since there is so much sexual immorality around us in our culture in our world what does god say to do <coughs> in first corinthians 7 1 through 9 i'm not going to read the whole passage but you can later do you want to cue all those verses yeah. This is your homework, guys. If we are piquing your interest on this topic and you want to study more and get yourself prepared for this month series, read these scriptures. They are so good. We have so much material that we can't cover today. We're just picking a few things. But I encourage you to, to uh, continue study on your own. So God says, since there is so much immorality, here we go. Ready? Each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. And they should fulfill their marriage vows. It's their duty. Now, this passage is also talking all about unless you have the gift of celibacy, where you can remain unmarried and, you know, fully serving God, and that's going, you know, well, that's what you're called to. That's a different case. But I I if you have the desire, um, then you should have a husband, have a wife, and fulfill your marriage vows. It's your duty. So regarding sex, since that's what we're talking about today, if you're married, you should be having regular sex. That's your that's fulfilling your marriage vows, and that's your duty. Can we get an amen <laughs> from the married people? <laughs> we got one in first service. <laughs> <laughs> Crack me up. That's great. So that's God's way, and that's great if everything's great between you and your spouse, right? But if there's pain and discord and dissension between you, or let's say maybe there's not a lot of dissension between you, but one person is like really still wounded from past things in their life that, that keeps them from being able to connect with their spouse in that way. Whatever it is, I really encourage you guys to work through it, you know, get help, get counseling, get healed up so you can have regular sex with your spouse that's all i'm gonna say about that that's great <laughs> well i love in the niv that what merely read is said this way now to the unmarried and the widows i say it is good for them to stay unmarried as i do but if they cannot control themselves they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion right so <coughs> again a gift of celibacy is a special thing that i do not have <laughs> right and uh it is so important 
the first thing to go in our experience, meeting with people for healing restoration and stuff and talking with friends and in our own experience, one of the first things to go when there's trouble in the marriage is the sex life because sex, God's way, is very emotionally intimate. And how can you be that emotionally intimate if you're in the middle of a fight, right? So the encouragement is resolve the fight, make up, and have sex as commanded by Scripture. <laughs> so um, I want to look at 1 Corinthians 13, which, um, you know, is the love chapter. It talks about what love is, but we want to look at it in the context of um, a God's way sex life, all right? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, and it goes on. Um, but when we are in the sexual arena of life, love is patient, right? So that means we are patient when we are not in the position to be having sex. We are patient. We hold out. We wait for God's designed time and place and person to be that way. Right? That can be times when you're married but you're apart. That can be when you're single, um, whether you're whatever age you are and you're in a single situation. What else? <coughs> Love is kind. So, uh, hey, you're married. Sex is uh, a good thing for you because you're married be kind so anything that would be unkind is out if it's kind and your spouse would agree that it's kind okay you know that's go forward with that so um you know i wouldn't put that on her if it's not you know the day for that you know what i mean <laughs> and and vice versa i wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't i wouldn't hold withhold because that wouldn't be kind, or she wouldn't withhold from me, because that wouldn't be kind. And that goes back to what Paul said in Corinthians. So a good sex life is kind, it's giving. Um, it does not dishonor others. So it should be honoring. Sex should be honoring of your um, spouse. It is not self-seeking. So uh, sex should be a giving act between spouses. Um, it shouldn't be a taking thing. You get a lot out of it. But it should not be motivated out of taking. It should not be self-seeking because love is not self-seeking. Um, and this, this really blends right into our next point, which is um, pornography doesn't do anything good for anyone except self. It is self-seeking. Whether that is, um, you know, it doesn't do any good for a computer screen to watch pornographic images. It doesn't do anything good for a magazine page to look, flip through those images. It doesn't do anything good for a paperback or hardback novel that is... Uh, full of emotional porn. <laughs> so that is out. We see it also in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus said, You have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Um, I'm not asking you to literally gouge out your eyes, but I think the point is take it seriously, you know? We need to take it seriously. In our world, this crooked farmhouse view is, is very much the opposite of that, you know? There, our sexual stuff and advertisement is so normal. And um, a couple of year old statistics now that I looked up last time we talked about this, pornography is rampant. 70% of men between 18 and 34 look at porn in a given night. That's a lot. That's more than a notch, I think. 70. So, um, and, and outside in the world, outside these four walls, people think it's just common and acceptable and a part of life. Um, you know, there are studies that say that the millennial generations that are coming to adulthood now, um, they have less sexual partners than the generations before them, but they're a lot more casual about sex. There's, there's a lot more pornography available to them. There's a lot more extrinsic benefits and stuff like that going on. So the world is very different than what Jesus told us to be like. So that is really, really good. Okay, so if you are hearing us talking about all of this and you are feeling like, oh my gosh, I've done, you know, you're feeling guilty because maybe you have done some sexually immoral things, guess what? As with all sin... 
If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9. And you're and not alone, for all have sinned yeah. and fall short of the glory of God. You're not the only one who has made that mistake, whatever one you know, you're thinking of. Yeah, in Romans 8, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so you can be completely forgiven. You can live according to the spirit and not according to the sinful nature. And um, God can totally heal and restore and turn you, you know, back into. He can. He's a miracle worker. So if you have of your own will and choosing done things um, sexually immoral, you can repent. He can wipe you clean. You can be made new. You can live for him. Or if you have had things done to you um, that were sexually immoral, God can also heal that and make you new and um, just restore the things that were taken from you. He, he's a miracle worker. It's not hard for him to make beauty out of ashes. Um, he's really good at it. So um, even though that he is so forgiving, we don't want to use that as an excuse, though, to sin. Right. That's an easy lie to fall in wh when the line gets smudged like, well, I'm just going to do this tonight and then tomorrow I'll repent. <laughs> Don't think like that, because every sin does have a consequence. There's always a consequence with it. You know, God forgave David and Bathsheba, but there were consequences. There was murder and sexual sin within the family for his immediate family and down his generational line because of that. But he did heal them. He did restore. They did have Solomon, and it was great. But I don't think David, if he had it over to do over again, I don't think he would have done it because there were still so many consequences, you know? So um, let's not go on sinning because of grace. All right, one more. Okay, so um, a lot of times... Sexual immorality is a battle in the mind, right? Maybe you're not actually doing something to someone or receiving something from someone, but it's in your mind. There's thoughts. Colossians 3 talks about that. Since you've been raised with Christ, set your minds and set your hearts. Set them on things above, not on earthly things. Um, for you died. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then it lists sexual immorality impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. And so um, we need to get really good at this, okay? Because we all have a, a sinful nature that, that we want to put to death and continue being alive in Christ. So we can take every thought captive and say, hey, is this thought um, God or not, you know? Um, and just having a thought isn't sin, but um, acting on it or entertaining it, leaning into that thought is. But if you just have a thought, that doesn't mean it's a sin. You can, you can reject that. You can renounce that. And just because a thought pops into your head, especially young, uh, young people, no, that doesn't mean it's yours. Because the enemy can talk to you in first person and say, I wonder what it would be like to do such and such with so-and-so. And then you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm a pervert or whatever, thinking that, you know. Well, the enemy wants to tell, tell us things. And so you can recognize that and say, wait, no, I, um, I say no to you, spirit of lust. I'm not agreeing with you. That's not my thought. That's not who I am. That's not my identity. I reject the spirit of lust or I, you know, reject the, the evil one. And, and Jesus, fill me with your truth. And you can fill your mind with, with what the truth is. Um, am I on track yet? Or yes. Oh, I have to go back on. So then this one I want to touch on because um, the enemy loves to do this, and it makes me so upset. I, I got emotional in first service and started tearing up. Um, because he loves it when we sin. He loves it because he can just then heap shame on you. And guess what happens when you have shame heaped on you? You feel depressed. You shrink back from who you are in Christ. You get the stamp of disqualified 
over your life, over your ministry, over yourself as a person, as a husband, as a, a father, as a mother, as a, you know, he wants you to shrink back and not be the person you're called to be. And so um, I have a passion <laughs> against shame because, um, you know, if you feel that, know that's from the enemy and not from God. Conviction is from God, and that leads us to repentance. And um, we're still going to feel sorry for those sins, but we're there's going to be a like a measure of hopefulness along with it and drawing us towards. So that's the difference. Um, so be the people you're called to be. Don't agree with shame and let shame keep you in the corner. Keep going. All right. You can recognize shame because shame encourages you to hide. We see it in the garden when Adam and Eve ate the fruit and all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, we're naked and they felt shame, it says, and then they start making clothes to cover up um, what didn't need covered up before. And so if you have sinned and you feel convicted, you will find yourself going towards Jesus. So like what First John 1, 9 said, that you know, like I'm going to confess my sin because he's faithful and just to forgive. So if you give me a clean slate, I, this is going to be good. You're going toward God. Shame is going the other direction. It's like, oh my gosh, I screwed up. I'm screwed up. Oh my gosh, I need to hide. Oh, now all of a sudden you're putting distance between yourself and God or between yourself and others. That's what shame looks like. So we want to avoid that. Any other things to pray for? Sure. Do you want like, I think what Marilee said is really, really good about a thought from the enemy that comes and says, you know, I'd really like to blah, 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 and recognizing and rejecting that. And there's kind of this point of ownership where it turns from a temptation to a sin, where it's like if you agree is when it becomes a sin, right? Like, just be straight about it. I'm out on the street. A lady walks by. We live near a college campus. She's not wearing a lot of stuff. And if the thought goes, oh, I wonder, blah, 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 I, I have that moment where I can go, no, 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 that's not me. I'm not doing that. I want to line up. I haven't sinned. But as soon as I go, yeah, well, let's look a little bit. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, I've said yes to some uh, a thought put there by the enemy. And then over time, something really sad that can happen is if you said yes, said yes, said yes, said yes, then all of a sudden there's legal ground in your life for the enemy to come into your shame and other things. Um, all of a sudden, you start to b you could start to believe that that is part of your identity, that I am fill in the blank, unforgivable, I am screwed up, I am a pervert, I am, you know, I have, this is an ownership word, I have a pornography addiction, or I have a fantasy life, or I have these thoughts or whatever, and I just encourage you to reject that, break agreement with it, say no, and confess it, repent, God will forgive you, and you can move forward, and and don't own it in the future. All right. Thank you. Need to wrap up. All right. Well, I want you guys to stand up. We're going to close. I just want to pray a blessing over you. I want to give you an opportunity to repent right now while we're talking about it, if there's anything that you've done. Um, so just open your hands, open your hearts, and receive. I just want to bless you. I just um, bless these words that you heard today to just um, – Go into your heart and, and really create that level and that plumb line to build your life and make choices that honor God and live life God's way. Because the best life you can possibly have is one that is lived in accordance with how he says to live. So I just bless you with an amazing life because you line up with his commands. I bless you to grow in self-control if you are struggling with sexual immorality. And I, um, I bless you to pursue righteousness, faith, and love, and peace, and, and turn your back on sexual immorality. Yeah, God, I just thank you. And I just pray blessing over um, anyone who's been sinned against, anyone who um, looked like the shattered paper when we, when we ripped the two pieces of construction paper apart. God, I just thank you that you are healer. And you've probably already done a lot of healing. But I, we just say more, Lord, more healing, more restoration. So important. I thank you that you care about us. You care what's happened to us, and you can make us new, and you're doing that. So I pray today 
you would do that even more in these people's lives. Thank you, Father. We just heal from the pain, the pain of, of sexual sin. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. And let's just um, pray a prayer of repentance if there's anything that, you know, that we've engaged with that's sexually immoral. If you want to come up here. Sure. So just if everyone would repeat after me, um, even if you're not, thank you. This group's up. We'll support whoever may want to, and we're just going to ask God's forgiveness and receive it. So repeat after me. Father God. I confess to you my sin, that I've been sexually immoral. I seek to agree with you about what is right and what is wrong. And I'm sorry for when I've been wrong. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross, which achieved for me forgiveness of sin and right relationship with God. So I trust in you. I believe that you really forgive me. And I choose to forgive myself. Thank you, God. Enable me to live a life where I flee from sexual immorality And I have a sex life your way. God, I pray you'd protect my thought life. God, I pray you'd protect my thought life. Help me to take every thought captive. Help me to take every thought captive. And kick out those that are not from you. And kick out those that are not from you. In Jesus' name.